Welcome to Open Minds. It's a show brought to you by me, Christopher Balkrin, where I'm attempting to explore big news issues from different perspectives. Each show will take a deep dive on one or two issues, and I'll share with you different ideas for you to consider as you're reading the news yourself. So with that, let's get started. Here in the city of Toronto, one of our suburbs outside the GTA, Greater Toronto Area, is called the city of Pickering, just in the east end of the city, and it's one of its councillors, is currently facing backlash after penning an op-ed criticizing Black History Month celebrations. Now, I will leave a link below to the councillor's op-ed piece. I will warn you, the spelling and the grammar is quite atrocious. By quite, I mean very. This person needs a lot of help. Just, just run it through spell check and grammar check. Just do that. Okay, so this person writes, Lisa Robinson, Councillor Lisa Robinson writes, why should the government have special programs for some races, almost excluding others as deeming those programs exclusive to one race? Special black business programs, black business loans. When we speak of black and white, there are many shades of white. There are many shades of brown, yellow, rat, red, black, and so on. As well, there is prejudice within the color spectrum. Those questions remain. What if there was a white history month? Would that not be seen as prejudice? Well, the rest of the year is white history month is the argument against that. But the counselor says, because history in general never has color, just episodes of history make references to the many conflicts and joint efforts of all color, much like during the wars, Soldiers of all races and colors fought for our freedom. They sacrificed without thought or division based on color. Well, the mayor of Pickering, Kevin Ash, actually came out today and apologized, saying, I believe that the recently published column is, in my view, racist, irresponsible, unethical. We should not give it more attention than it deserves, except for the fact that it causes real harm. This does not represent the city, and what we stand for. City Councilor Lisa Robbins' op-ed, despite its lack of polish and finish, and for any counselor out there writing an op-ed, please run your op-eds through spell check and grammar, raises an interesting dilemma of diversity in our city. Toronto, where I grew up, is perhaps one of the most diverse cities in the world. Is one of the pain points with diversity Choosing to look at some groups and not look at others. Is that what the counselor potentially is getting at? That we have Black History Month, but we don't have a month or a day or a week or a year dedicated to many other groups that experience levels of discrimination and harassment. We know here in Canada, groups like the Jewish community, the Muslim community, and the Indigenous community generally are at the top when it comes to hate crimes, discrimination, and threats of violence, we know this, as well as the black community, certainly. Now, these are stats that are provided by various police reports across our country, not only in Canada, in the United States as well. But here's a question, coming back to the statistics of this all, how many groups go to the police and report hate crimes? Now, I'm a person of color to some people, I guess they consider me a person of color. I have never, once thought of going to the police and reporting a hate crime. But at the same time, I've never experienced what a Jewish person experiences opening their door and seeing a swastika on their garage door. That would cause such fear inside me that I'm not safe in my community. And I would go to the police. As well, if I were black and I experienced someone calling me the N-word repeatedly, numerous times, especially in places of worship or in institutions, I would definitely go to the police if it weren't consistent enough. But I have a suspicion that most people who are not white experience some form of discrimination and harassment and don't go to the police. And because of that, our hate crimes and statistics may be vastly underreporting what in fact is the reality for many Canadians. So to the counselor's point, perhaps there are groups that experience some form of discrimination and harassment in our societies that routinely go under or unreported. And maybe that's what the counselor is getting at. 
the idea that perhaps we should think of other groups that experience discrimination. That's just an idea. But the counter to this, obviously, to me, is there are well-documented research and statistics about black people experiencing discrimination. People being looked over for job uh, uh, and career advance, advancement. Black people looking, uh, being looked over for loan applications. These are well-documented statistics. And so perhaps the specialized black business programs, black business loans, etc., are responding to an actually known phenomena in our society, and our governments are trying to be proactive. But it does open a Pandora's box because there are many groups who do not go to the police, do not go to statisticians and researchers and talk about the discrimination that they fa faced when applying for a loan or applying for a business. I can imagine people who don't speak English as a first language and have a thick accent perhaps also fear discrimination, also fear not getting a loan, not being treated equally, but they would never go to the police or any other institution to share with them their discrimination that they faced, the discrimination that they faced. So perhaps there's, there's also that. But when it comes to celebrating any community, whether it's the black community, the Jewish community, the Muslim community, the LGBTQ community, I find that you're naturally going to have people who are critical of that because perhaps they feel like other groups are not being celebrated or perhaps they feel, why is this one group being given preferential treatment when we live in one of the most tolerant societies this world has ever seen? And to the latter, I would say that certainly we are and definitely there is still discrimination and harassment and, and prejudice on some level. But it, it makes you wonder, is this in fact the intersection of diversity when we fully embrace it? When we fully embrace diversity, there will be groups that will be left out and will experience discrimination. And what's our answer to that? I'm not too sure. Okay, moving on. This has been a topic on the CBC's website for many years. My top surgery wasn't what I imagined, but it helped me accept myself. As a non-binary person, Egan Johnson is embracing what makes their body unique. Now, I will say that as part of my podcast called the Open Minds Podcast, I'm routinely on the CBC's website. It's Canada's National Broadcaster's website. And I'm always looking for information, data, news sources. And this article has been posted on the CBC's website numerous times, I would say over the past year, year and a half. In summary, Egan Johnson, who is non-binary, shares their journey as a non-binary individual undergoing top surgery to remove breast tissue. They reflect on their struggles with body image due, due to puberty, feeling uncomfortable and disconnected from their own body. Discovering the term non-binary, though, provided some level of clarity and sense of belonging. Their decision to undergo top surgery, which is the removal of breast tissue, brought relief. It addressed the physical and mental weight associated with their chest. Initially considering breast reduction for a more moderate change, they eventually opted for full top surgery or the full removal of breast tissue. However, post-surgery, the reality differed from their expectations, leading to initial disappointment and self-doubt. Now, I must say the article also includes a topless picture of Egan post-surgery. Despite the initial challenges and adjustments of expectations, the healing process for Egan brought a positive shift. Egan experienced increased confidence, a return to their outgoing self, and ability to navigate dating, which I can imagine can be challenging. The journey taught them to embrace imperfections, scars, and unique features as integral parts of self-discovery and self-acceptance. They acknowledged the ongoing process of learning to love every aspect of their transformed body. Now here's a question. 
The issue of top surgery or uh, surgery involving the removal of, of reproductive organs, etc., is still very contentious here in Canada. And one, I would argue, is not studied enough because I think there are many there are many Canadians who are unwilling to come out with their viewpoint on these issues for fear of reprisal, when really it's out of curiosity. So, for example, many Canadians may wonder why someone may want top surgery. And this article doesn't do the why justice. Instead, it talks about Egan's personal journey. Presuming that people across the country are on board with Egan getting top surgery. Now, I know this is an uncomfortable question for many Canadians to face, but the reality is, I would surmise many Canadians don't agree or at least question Egan's choice to have top surgery. In fact, recently, the Premier of Alberta, Daniel Smith, put forward policies to keep parents informed about uh, various things, whether that's changing your pronouns, your gender identity, etc. But according to an Angus Reid poll, Canadians overwhelmingly agree with Premier Daniel Smith's recently policy changes that parents should always remain informed. When asked parents how involved they should be or they want to be with their children regarding gender and pronouns, 43% said parents should have to give consent to such changes, and 35% said parents should at least be informed of them. That means nearly four out of five Canadians say that parents should be informed when their children want to change their pronouns or gender identity. 78% of Canadians. And yet, if you read the article posted on CBC Canada's national broadcaster on their front page, of Egan Johnson, you would assume that Canadians agree with Egan Johnson's top surgery, and this was just what to expect. But in reality, the real uncomfortable conversation needs to be had in Canada about whether or not children should be able to learn about these types of surgeries, perhaps before they are consenting adults or of consenting age. And that's a real uncomfortable conversation to have. Now, the flip side to this, some would argue, would be the article of Egan Johnson and the CBC's decision to put it on its front page is a way of normalizing the conversation. It's in fact a way to make top surgery in this case normal, part of our lexicon, part of our dinner table discussions, part of our culture that is Canada part of the cultural fabric that is Canada, the embrace, the acceptance, the celebration of young people undergoing these surgeries and also creating an environment where they feel safe and welcome and supported. But I find that that argument skips over a really important step in this social change which is understanding and awareness. You have to build that in before you get to normalizing a conversation. And there are multiple examples of enacting social change that happened over generations, but started with awareness and understanding. And we can't ever do away with that because even after a social change is normalized, we still have awareness and understanding that needs to constantly be reinforced on a daily basis. After all, civil rights was won for black people. But ask many black people in the United States, and I would argue that some would say racism is still very well alive, and it comes from a place of ignorance, of not understanding each other, or not building that awareness of each other. So, Here's a question to the CBC and to all everyone watching. The article on Egan Johnson's top surgery, I find, is a bit of a stretch to put on the front page when the
the awareness and understanding just isn't there yet for most Canadians. And until we get there, it'll be harder for us to normalize this social change as part of the awareness and understanding. I think at first we have to build that awareness and understanding before we get to normalizing conversations on top surgery. That's just my opinion. But what do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. So we've come to the end of the show for today and I wanted to share with you a nugget of wisdom, information, knowledge I've discovered about myself in this process. You know, I was that person who didn't share his political views all the time for fear of being silenced or being yelled at or being told you're wrong. <laughs> but it turns out other people are wrong. Other people are wrong for insinuating that. There, if someone shares their political opinion with you, you have every right to share yours back, in my opinion. And it's not out of a place of malice or a place of trying to be combative and fight people and get them to believe what you believe. No, I don't think that at all. In fact, I think what's missing in our discourse is a robust exchange of differing perspectives. And I've seen with my own two eyes the silencing of many perspectives for fear and re retribution of some type of reprisal and that's not the way to go about it. The better way to do this is to share your opinion. It may not be the most informed opinion. It may not be the most, I need to get every stat right or else I'm going to lose. It's like, doesn't need to be that way. What needs to happen is we need to be respectful in how we share our dissenting opinions. And let's face it, not all of us will agree. And I think for those who bring up politics at the dinner table, in the workplace, in places of public where you're just trying to get go around, go about your day, if you bring up politics, you're looking to divide people. I personally never talk politics. But I know that if I if someone else were to bring it up, I'm willing to discuss it. But I'm not willing to be silent. And that's a really hard skill to learn because there's a level of respect as well. So on my journey through Open Minds, I'm going to continue sharing my perspective in a respectful way that I think benefits our public square. And I would encourage you all to do the same. That's it. Episode one is done. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think. Take care, everyone.